I would now like to introduce our second keynote speaker, uh, Mehmet Ozal. Uh, I'm told I should put a, a, a sort of a special accent on the Mehmet, but my Western tongue can't get around that. Mehmet, me, is that right? Mehmet. 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 Me, me, me. With an H. With an H, sorry. Um, uh, perhaps I thought I was speaking Gaelic for a minute. So. Anyway. Uh, Mehmet, is, uh, Mehmet is an associate professor in the Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization at Charles Sturt University in Sydney. He has developed and written material for numerous courses on Islamic theology, history, and contemporary issues around Islam. He is one of the co-founders of the Affinity Intercultural Foundation, an organization that has fostered intercultural and interfaith harmony in Sydney since 2000. In 2009, Mehmet also founded ISRA, or Israel Australia, an educational and research organization providing information and educational services uh, on Islam and Muslims. Mehmet is the author of three books, 101 Questions You Asked About Islam, Islam in the Modern World, and Islam Between Tradition and Modernity, an Australian Perspective. He has also co-authored Sustained Dialogue, Close Encounters of the Muslim Christian Kind. Over to you, Mehmet. Thank you. Thank you, Barney. And uh, it's always risky to follow Greg, such an expert in the field. Uh, he covered a lot of the ground. And, uh, but I'm hoping to give my slant to the whole the topic and the questions. Um, understanding the sectarian dimensions of the uh, conflict in Iraq and Syria. Uh, obviously, uh, the situation is far more complex than that. Um, and uh, I just want to, in this short presentation, focus on three key questions around this topic. The first one is, um, is that what is the nature of conflict really? Is it sectarian or is there something else or maybe a collection of factors involved to generate the circumstances and the results that we are seeing at the moment? Uh, secondly, uh, is violence committed in the region based on sectarianism, Islam, or some other thing? Uh, and, uh, and also, why are young Muslims are joining ISIS, especially from Australia? Obviously, we are worried about Australian government and society, and all of us are worried about people uh, being trained uh, in uh, violence, killing, and uh, overcome the psychological barrier of death, and uh, come back to Australia uh, and obviously not sit there and do nothing and do other things. So there's a serious threat, as Greg has mentioned, uh, to safety in societies all around the world. Uh, so why, how, how can, how do these uh, uh, students' comfortable lives, they go and risk their lives in the Middle East? I'll be touching on that a little bit. Uh, there is actually three layers of complexity in um, in the Middle East at the moment, and players as well. Um, and starting from the top, there is a, a world powers and a disagreement amongst them about what to do with the Arab Spring uh, and the conflict in Syria. If you recall, when Arab Spring first came out, uh, the Western world really didn't understand it. Uh, didn't know what to do to support it, not to support it. Uh, obviously, falling of governments, even if they were dictatorships, would unsettle uh, the political situation landscape. And, and who was to replace that was uncertain. So there was a confusion uh, in the uh, in the world, world within world powers, about what to do with Arab Springs, and particularly the Syria situation. There was a stalemate. Uh, if you recall, Libya was okay, well, not easy, but uh, eventually the NATO got involved, America got involved, the Gaddafi was deposed. Tunisia and Egypt, uh, the leaders were removed without any fighting. And Syria, it was thought that you know the other countries will follow, uh, and Syria being one of them. But it didn't turn out that way. There was a long uh, period of um, kind of an impasse between uh, China, Russia, who had some vested interest in Syria and the region, uh, and then America, European Union, and NATO, uh, and no one was really out there to push the situation to either side. 
Uh, so that created a huge problem. Uh, and naturally, uh, then the resistance got, um, there was, uh, I'll come back to that a little bit. Um, and there's also regional powers involved uh, with different visions for the, uh, for the area. Um, you know, you have um, the, the three main powers are Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. And you have Saudi Arabia who wants to make sure the governments uh, or whoever's in power are aligned with their vision of Islam and the region. And you have Iran who's pushing for a, a Shiite kind of uh, influence in the whole area, span going from uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and, and kind of uh, Iran at the same time. So usually uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran are at odds each other in the, in the region, in all conflicts. Um, it's not just sectarian, but it's political as well as ideological. Uh, then there's Turkey, which is an interesting case. Uh, is Turkey, just p before Arab Springs, tried to have this kind of like a European Union in the area. You know, they signed sort of deals removing visas and, and economic uh, uh, you know, agreements with uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and then they were negotiating with Iraq and, and Egypt. Uh, the Erdogan's uh, at the time prime minister, uh, he, he wanted to have a kind of an influence, neo-Ottoman revival of the era with the influence of the current <coughs> prime, uh, prime minister, Ahmed Davutoglu. Um, but that sort of, uh, it was a critical moment with Arab Springs because that's, uh, the, the Turkish government wanted to influence that. And uh, they wanted to have Muslim Brotherhood in power in Egypt. And also another Muslim uh, you know, presence, not necessarily ISIS or, or Al-Qaeda derivatives, but they wanted Assad to go. And they encouraged the resistance to base themselves in Turkey and kind of go to a, 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 a military struggle. This was a pivotal moment that tipped uh, the situation in uh, Syria into a violent one, a civil war. And with civil war, uh, when international powers were not doing anything, uh, all these little groups started popping up. The Nusra Front, you know, Al-Qaeda. At the time, when Baghdadi and Al-Qaeda was based in Iraq, they now moved into Syria with Nusra Front, was the representative of Al-Qaeda. And Baghdadi kind of had to work with that. There's also a third uh, layer of uh, complexity uh, that's the ideological, ethnic, and religious differences at the local level. You know, it, um, ideologically, there are secular people, religious people, and uh, and they have different vision for society. From an ethnicity, you know, Syria and Iraq are uh, kind of split between Kurds, Turkmens, and Arabs. Uh, the same, similar with uh, Syria, uh, and then you have from a religious line. Uh, the Shia and Sunni differences, uh, especially Assad is different. He comes from a Nusairi or Alawi uh, branch of uh, Shiite uh, Islam. And then that was one of the main reasons to get rid of uh, Assad. Not that well, he was also a dictator and, and so on. Uh, so all of this, the result of this is a, as a huge uh, power vacuum created by the chaos in Iraq and the civil war in Syria. <coughs> and where there is vacuum, you know, the nature fills it with uh, something else. Uh, sort of, it sort of kindled the stress points on regional tectonic fault lines. And similar to, I, I sort of uh, give the similarity between Afghanistan during, after the Soviet invasion. And as you know, uh, there was a bit of a struggle there between America and so Soviet Union during the Cold War era. Uh, the United States supported Mujahideen against the Russians. And then when uh, Russia collapsed, Soviet Union collapsed, uh, there was a power vacuum. And then uh, all these little groups, Mujahideen groups, started fighting one another. And when that was kind of inconclusive, Taliban emerged from that vacuum. And usually, people, uh, the groups with puritanical sort of understanding of Islam uh, they have a bit more confidence and zeal, and also not having fear of death. 
and, uh, and they tend to become stronger, come out stronger in these civil strifes. And it's not different in the, in the case of Syria. Exactly the same thing happened. And I personally have warned people and whoever I could see at the time that you're just going to have exactly the same situation in Afghanistan. And, and unfortunately, I'm proven right. Um, and, uh, you know, ISIS capitalized on this vacuum with a goal of establishing a state. Now, until ISIS, uh, all these Nusra Front, uh, Free Syrian Army, they, they had a single goal of toppling Assad regime. Uh, who rules the country, how you do it, democracy or otherwise, was a prob later pro secondary problem. First, you had to get rid of Assad. And because he wasn't going anywhere, uh, and, uh, and this is the, the clever uh, tactic of Baghdadi and his friends, they switched their goal from toppling Assad to establishing a state. And that's what has been one of their success points, because no one else was doing that. There was a power vacuum, all these territories who were, no one was uh, ruling and governing the area. And uh, I, I actually met a couple of people from the uh, Free Syrian uh, group, not the, from the army, but uh, some religious people uh, from there. And they said that, they said, we fight and liberate an area from Assad regime, these guys come and occupy it. They're not fighting you know, Assad. They're just uh, grabbing land as much as they could. And for them, it's an opportunity. The speed is important. The more, the, the quicker they move, the, the more land they will capitalize. The more land they, they capitalize, uh, the more powerful they become, and the more people they can recruit. Um, now, I just want to move on to the uh, the causes of this. Uh, Greg alluded to this. Uh, uh, there is a, a researcher, Robert Pape, and he, he wrote this book called Cutting the Fuse, the Explosion of Global Suicide Terrorism and How to Stop It. And I, I, although this is on suicide bombing, the research is really eye-opener. And he said that in the suicide bombings that happened from 1980 to 2003, there were 345 of them, 50% uh, of the attacks were done by secular groups, not religious people. And the uh, Tamil Tigers topped the list. And the suicide bombing, and they, as you know, they are sort of kind of a Buddhist nationalist group. And the Kurdish group PKK, which is a kind of a Marxist, socialist, uh, secular group, uh, carried more than one third of the attacks in Muslim territories. Um, and 95% of these attacks were done with the aim of compelling occupying forces to leave territory, what they thought was an invading force. And obviously, after 2003, there was the invasion of uh, Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan and so on. A lot more happened. And he's done his research, uh, repeated it, second, the second edition of the book. And this time, in that seven years, there were 1,800 suicide bombing attacks. And 87% uh, and of them were in Iraq and Afghanistan, 12% in Pakistan. And the one in Pakistan, it happened in Waziristan and all these regions where, you know, the, it was thought to be Taliban was uh, uh, kind of residing and then uh, there was drone attacks. So people in that region were thinking, okay, they're next in the invasion and uh, kind of joined this uh, Al-Qaeda or uh, Taliban um, uh, fighting or resisting. So basically, Robert Pape uh, concludes that it's the occupation that is the source of uh, suicide bombing, terrorism, and everything else that comes with that. People are thinking, people who fight in this or take part in this are thinking they are liberating a land from foreign powers. I mean, uh, for us, uh, you know, if, for example, if you think about Afghanistan, uh, and we think, oh, well, if, the, if people just stay quiet, don't do anything, America will leave, right? Uh, even, because they don't want to be there, they're spending money. We think that because we're exposed to all this information. And, uh, but the people in Afghanistan don't know that. They have no idea of why they're there and what the intentions are and when they will leave. So they're thinking we have to fight to liberate the land. And uh, uh, so there is a process to people being radicalized and joining these uh, 
groups to fight. And at the bottom is the territorial occupation. There's an actual and perceived suffering create intense rage and anger. And we know that uh, uh, there has been some interviews of people who've been uh, part of ISIS and other groups. Uh, they get watched certain graphic images of Muslims being killed, raped, or things like that. Much worse than ever grave, you know, the pictures that were circulated. You don't see it, but these people have those in their possession, and they're circulated on social media or in video cassettes or, or CDs. Uh, so people are, are they, they, they get them watch these things, and that creates an anger and rage, uh, which creates a strong desire to retaliate. Uh, I gotta do something, I have to stop this. This is insane suffering uh, that uh, is being uh, uh, experienced by Muslims. I don't know if you watched that ABC interview or interview that never happened between in, uh, Wasim Durui, the head of, or one of the representatives of Hizbut Tahrir. He said something there, really, it's important. Uh, when the, uh, Emma said, uh, how do you know, how do you know that there's all these, uh, bad uh, in results of invasion. He said, we don't need evidence, we don't need research, we are experiencing it. And uh, that was, uh, I remember that part of the interview. Uh, that's exactly what they say to these people. Um, so, but what happens is that there's an ethical dilemma that's created in the mind of a Muslim. Because normally they, people know Islam as peaceful religion, you just do pray five times a day you know, the five pillars of Islam, become a good person, don't hurt anybody, don't even steal, you know, don't lie. There's all these ethics of Islam, spirituality, but when you're confronted with these things to ask to retaliate, kill people, uh, then that creates an ethical dilemma in the minds of a person. And we call that in psychology cognitive dissonance. And uh, when somebody has that in their mind, one of them has to be removed. And we, we all do that in our lives, you know, when we we want to do something we, we know we shouldn't. We give ourselves reasons why it's okay. This is called rationalization. So that's what happens next. Uh, and in that process, uh, this is where uh, the publications that Greg mentioned are very important. And also, it's not just publications. There are people who actually meet these uh, people who are recruited. It never <coughs> just happens online. They read stuff and they say, I want to go get a ticket. Somebody meets them, somebody talks to them and convinces them. And they uh, do that by appealing to religious authority and religious texts to justify uh, these actions. Uh, this is where the Khalifa or Caliph title for Abu Bakr Baghdad becomes very important. But there's something else in there most people don't know. His full name is uh, Abu Bakr al Husseini al Baghdadi. You know why Husseini? Because there is a, um, Husseini means he's related to the Prophet's line. Hassani and Husseini, the Prophet's line comes from two lines, his bloodline. Um, and he claims to be related to the Prophet, his bloodline, uh, Prophet Muhammad. And, uh, to, uh, and that is very important for the Shiites because the leader must come from the family of the Prophet. And also, he is from Baghdad, local, as Greg mentioned, and he is the Caliph. Co three com combination of these things give him, gives him legitimacy. Well, this is why they have these titles. We don't know if he's really related. I doubt it, uh, to the Prophet. And uh, just because there was no Caliph, I mean, he could claim a Caliphate because there was no other Caliph. And, uh, and, you know, in, the, in Islamic, traditional Islamic law, uh, if there is a legitimate leader and you don't, if you don't swear allegiance to this leader, you could be killed. You become a murtad. There was a word there in the uh, magazine, murtadin, repent. Murtad means someone who's an apostate. So they repent and come back to the religion again. So in their mind, anyone who does not swear religions or support this uh, ISIS organization are apostates. They're not Muslim. Therefore, they could be killed. That's a very important 
argument to remove that, again, the ethical barrier of killing Muslims. Because they are killing Muslims. Um, and, uh, and sometimes uh, even more Muslims are killed than anyone else. And, uh, and then uh, exposure to ideology and then, uh, there is a, a euphoria, a euphoric promise for success. That, that's very apparent in the magazine. I, I want to thank Greg for showing us all these magazines because I can't look at them. Because if I do, I'm afraid I could be arrested for having possessions of you know, a terrorist group. <laughs> In my, uh, if you're a Muslim, uh, you stay away from these things. So it was really good for me to look at that. Uh, I, I don't want your slides. <laughs> in my, um, okay. Yeah. So that's kind of how it happens. And there was a, a documentary. It was. I don't know if anyone's seen that live. It was called "Going Embedded with ISIS." And what, what I've seen there was, the people, these people are in euphoria. They're thinking their dreams are being realized. And, uh, and again, the dignity, the indignity of being occupied, being in civil war, corrupt regimes, uh, death that comes from these other things, and they are claiming to create safety for people. Um, so I would say that uh, in terms of ISIS, we should classify the atrocities as war crimes, not terrorism. There is a war situation, whether we recognize them or not, they have a state, as Greg said, and uh, they have an army. So they're fighting a war, and whatever they do, atrocities in that should be considered war crimes. And there are a lot of them, uh, as we have seen. Uh, now, mass killings are a tactical strategy to scare people to submission, save time and cost. Uh, now, uh, Mongols used to do this back in the 13th century. You go to a town, you say, surrender. No, we don't surrender. So they fight, they kill everybody in the city. That's a lesson to the next town. If you don't surrender, this is what's going to happen to you. So they are doing the same tactic. Yazidis or these other groups, times whoever resists them, uh, they kill the mass on purpose to teach a lesson. And that's why that's one of the reasons why they've been able to move so fast. People are just scared and they don't they're not organized to defend themselves. There's no, no one to support them, so they just submit to them. Uh, and also save time and cost. Who's gonna look after all these war um, uh, you know, prisoners of war, who's going to look after them? It costs money and time. You have to soldiers. You just get rid of them. Uh, so time is a very important for them. The more, the faster they move, the more land they, they can grab. Um, and social media is used, obviously, and Western media are used to recruit people to their cause. Now, you might be surprised why I say that. Uh, and I'm pretty uh, purposefully saying that Western media is used by ISIS cleverly to recruit people to their cause. I just want to show you two images. Uh, this is James Foley. I, I couldn't sleep after watching this. I didn't watch the actual thing, but I, I saw this image. Like The face of Foley is very sad, isn't it? Like, there's a dignity there. There's a disappointment. There's a helplessness. Uh, I don't, I don't understand for the life of me how can a Muslim just kill a person like that? And he went to you know Syria for humanitarian reasons, but they sort of justify this by saying that he was a spy. Yeah, they always do this. You know, the argument is they always do this. The Westerners, they come with the, you know, helping you guys, uh, humanitarian. So they come as spies and then uh, they do all sorts of things. So James Foley, Foley in their minds was, was a spy. Whether they believe that or not, I don't know, but that's the argument. Uh, you know, this showing this was, uh, it wasn't for really Western people to scare them and uh, to get them angry or things like that. It was mainly to show Muslims, we are winning the war. Look, we are uh, the white people. Uh, you know, Americans, British, they are in our possession as a prisoner, and he's guilty, 
and uh, and we are sentencing them to death and we are winning the war and this was more apparent with the next photo here of that 17 year old kid from Australia uh, this was a publicity stunt uh, it was a bait to world powers uh, sort of world media to show it to the world right so if, you, if they have it in the magazine as a or social media things as Greg said only a few people will see the, the, the people in the bubble. But this went out to the whole globe. And uh, this was all staged. The whole, there's a wall of fighters with machine guns, uniform, they're all young, uh, different nationalities, perhaps you could pick out different. Uh, and here's a 17 year old kid, kid who was probably put down by in his school by his parents. Uh, just be disciplined, study hard, get a job. Uh, you know, doesn't have aim, proper aim in, in life, and all of a sudden he's a hero in the sense, center stage of the world. The message here is that you can be like this. You can be a hero. Oh, I'll finish. Uh, you can be a hero, and uh, and here's an army. We are winning this war. Uh, it was a recruitment campaign, and the whole media fell right into it. Okay, just to conclude, uh, the situation in Iraq and Syria is very complex. <coughs> Sectarianism is just one of the fault lines. It is used to recruit people as once again. And recruitment, by the way, is never one, one, uh, one thing. Whoever they talk to, the argument is different. So if it's a Sunni person, uh, look, we are fighting against Shiites. We're fighting against Iran, uh, Assad and it can become a sectarian. But for, some, for someone who's rich, uh, they, they have dignity and glory. Someone who's poor, they give money. And I, I learned this from as well, from the Syrian people. Uh, is out of all the groups in Syria, ISIS pays double to its fighters. So who are you gonna fight with, you know, if you were one of them? Uh, and, uh, and one of those Australian kids uh, said on the media, is I paid 500, Syrian leader for Cocoa Pops. It sort of misses Cocoa Pops the most. <laughs> um, and ISIS is a product of a power vacuum. They really capitalized on you know, that, that vacuum, cleverly declaring the caliphate. And, um, and again, it puts a lot of Muslims in a, in a moral dilemma. If they don't support the caliphate, there is kind of a religious obligation to do so. If they support, if they're not, you know, good Muslims, they're violent. It's a, it's a big, uh, big problem for them. And atrocities are a means for recruitment of fighters. And media has to be very careful not to be an instrument of recruitment. Thank you very much.